Hello and happy first day of spring. Welcome to the Anglican Church of St. John the Baptist Dixie in Mississauga, Ontario. I'm Father Daniel Brereton, and thank you for joining us for this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. Beginning next week, we observe the holiest week in the Christian calendar called Holy Week. We begin next Sunday with Palm Sunday, and here at St. John's, we, we keep the focus on the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem with Palm Sunday, uh, and then we'll follow that with uh, a Wednesday evening service, our last Lenten Vesper service, which will incorporate um, elements of the Tenebrae ritual. Then Monday, Thursday, with the commemoration of the Last Supper, a Holy Eucharist, and the stripping of the altar followed by Good Friday's commemoration of the crucifixion, and then Easter Sunday morning when we'll begin in the darkness of the Easter vigil and have the lighting of the new Paschal candle, followed by the triumphant uh, celebration of Christ's resurrection. I hope that you'll join us for as many of those services as you can, and please know that you're welcome at all. And thank you for joining us for today's worship. O oh, come, let us worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Blessed be God, who forgives all our sins. Whose mercy endures forever. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Let us pray. We are truly sorry 
and humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Most merciful God, by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you created humanity anew. May the power of his victorious cross transform those who turn in faith to him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. After Jesus had said this, he departed and hid from them. The Gospel of Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, who is eternal love, incarnate word, and abiding spirit. Amen. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now, isn't that what every church wants? Newcomers, and the disciples don't even need to go knocking on doors or drop off leaflets in order to get them. 
These Greeks, not likely Gentiles, but probably Hellenistic Jews living in the diaspora, have returned to Jerusalem for Passover, and of their own accord, they're seeking Jesus. And as far as we know, they never do get to meet Jesus. As soon as the disciples excitedly tell him about these Greeks, Jesus completely changes the subject, turning the disciples' attention to a topic that they just can't stop him from talking about, dying. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, Jesus says, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The disciples' frustration with Jesus constantly talking about his own death, probably begins to turn to a deep sense of discomfort as they realize he's not just talking about his own death now. He's talking about ours. Following this Jesus just gets harder and harder. Of course, once seeds are actually planted, they don't cease to exist, which is how a lot of us think of death. Rather, they are transformed into something more. Perhaps through the use of this metaphor, Jesus is not just telling his disciples about the need to die, but actually explaining what he means by death. That the death that he is calling us to share in is not an end to physical life. It's not about ceasing to exist in this world, but to be transformed in it, to be made into something new something greater. After seeds are buried in the earth, they do need to stop being merely seeds. They stop just being what they've always been as they undergo a process of growth and transformation. And from the seed's perspective, that process isn't necessarily a pleasant one. They're split open so that they can put down roots deep into the earth and push shoots up above the earth to bear fruit or grain, to be a far greater benefit as a full-grown plant than they could ever be as a single seed. But a seed also can't do this all on its own. A seed doesn't decide that it's just going to uh, begin a process of self-improvement. To transform, a seed needs to submit to forces beyond itself, to light, to water, to the, to the darkness of its own tiny tomb in the earth. And yes, maybe even to a little manure for fertilization. Jesus is telling us that like the seed, we also need to stop clinging to the way we've always been in order to be transformed into what we were created to be. We need to stop resisting the change, the death to the old way, so that we can embrace a new and different way. Those who love their life lose it, Jesus says, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Just as last week, we looked at John 3.16, those famous words of Jesus, for God so loved the world, and we talked about how some Christians have taken those well-known words and twisted it into a different meaning than what Jesus actually meant. And I think we need to be similarly careful with these words of Jesus too. Because this call to hate life can too easily be heard and preached as a justification for demonizing and destroying or despairing of other people's lives. So what exactly is Jesus talking about? Three times in this verse, Jesus uses the word life. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And in the original Greek in which this gospel is written, Jesus uses two different words for life, the first two times that Jesus speaks of loving and losing life, he uses the word psyche, which has been translated as mind or soul, but I think we could better understand as ego, that self-protective, self-defensive identity. 
The third time that Jesus speaks of eternal life, Jesus uses the word zoe, which doesn't mean place, but it actually means a, a way of living, a manner of life. So when Jesus speaks of eternal life, he doesn't just mean heaven as a place that we go to after we physically die. He's talking about a way of living that we can start now once we are reborn or born again, as he spoke to Nicodemus last week. The word hate that Jesus uses here is best understood as reject or don't cling to. So what Jesus is really saying is not, I want you to have really negative feelings about life in this world and just focus instead on going to heaven after you die, which is often how I've heard this passage understood. Instead, he's saying he wants us to stop clinging to the world's way of living, a life based on building up and protecting the ego at the expense of other lives. Reject the way of life that the world wants you to live, and instead start living the way that I have been showing you, a way that I've been demonstrating with my own life. Jesus' message here isn't a warning to despise the world and everyone in it, especially those who aren't like us. After all, God so loved the world. Rather, Jesus' words about not loving our life, but rejecting it, not clinging to it, it's an invitation to begin living in this world in a new way, a way not based on defending and building up the self-centered and self-protective ego that the world has said is your life, but instead to cultivate a way of living based on the way and the truth and the life of God that has been shown to us in Jesus. But of course, to start a new life, you have to be willing to let go of the old, to be resurrected you have to die. And every follower of Jesus is tempted, as Jesus himself was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane, to find a way around the cross. You know, if this cup can pass from me, Father, but there is no way around the cross. One can only go through it. What we often want is, is a little bit of self-improvement, right? We, we want to pray and we want to, to cultivate a relationship with Jesus because maybe Jesus can help us redecorate a little. But what Jesus is offering is a complete renovation. And as anyone who's ever renovated knows, that's always a lengthier and more costly process and project than you sometimes felt you were signing up for. For some, the death that Jesus calls us to, the death to self, may come as suddenly and as painfully as nails through hands and feet, like an addict turning away finally from the addiction that has been destroying them, or someone who decides finally to leave an abusive marriage or an abusive relationship or situation and start all over again. For most of us, though, I suspect the death that Jesus calls us to will be more like a crucifixion by a thousand pinpricks, a daily choosing of obedience to the Spirit's call over the ego's demands of gratification. It won't be one dramatic thing. It'll be a whole lot of mundane, everyday things where we have to choose the voice of God over the voice of the ego where we have to follow the way of Jesus instead of the way we want to go. I will put my law within them, God said, and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, know the Lord, for they will all know me. We read in the first passage today from Jeremiah. That's what the Lord wants for us, for us to know him, for us to have a relationship with him, a relationship rooted in the trust that God will provide, in the mercy that God will forgive, 
in the compassionate love that God will remain faithful to us. And such a relationship with God transforms all our relationships, allows allows them to be more trusting and loving and forgiving as well. I think that's what Jesus is offering his disciples and what he wants his disciples to offer to others. That's what I want for every person who comes to, to me as a Christian, who comes to this church, whether it's actually to this building or reaching out to us online, what I want them to find is Jesus. Whatever people come looking for, like those Greeks, whether it's friendship in the midst of loneliness, whether it's hope in the midst of suffering, whether it's an answer to a question they've long struggled with, or just a place where it's safe to ask questions without judgment, whether it's someone who's just willing to listen and to see them, whatever people come looking for, what I hope they find, what I hope they see, is Jesus. This past week, people in the LGBT community and those who love them saw the church tell the world that their most faithful commitments could not be blessed because their love is sin. And a few days later, we were all horrified by the killings in Atlanta as a white man raised in the church shot eight people, specifically targeting Asian women because, in his very religious words, he needed to eliminate temptation. I broke my Lenten social media fast for a day because I wanted to go online and see what what people were saying about this, particularly friends and colleagues. And to be fair, I saw a lot of Christians speaking out. But you know, the very first group of people I came across from my own tradition a group of Anglican clergy and Episcopalian clergy, they were passionately arguing amongst themselves about whether clergy should or should not wear rose-colored vestments on the fourth Sunday of Lent. Now, to be fair, I would rather have Christians arguing about vestments than about which which human lives uh, are allowed to exist or not. But still, I couldn't help thinking This week, a whole lot of people have seen the church, but I don't know how many people have actually seen Jesus. It used to bother me that, as far as we know, Jesus never did meet with those Greeks. I always thought that was kind of rude. Like Jesus was treating those Greeks the way too many churches treat newcomers at coffee hour. You know, we politely acknowledge their presence and then we just ignore them. But now I wonder, maybe Jesus was making a point to his disciples by not meeting with those Greeks. Maybe he was was saying, this isn't my job anymore. He was getting ready for a time when he will be lifted up from the earth, not just on the cross, but also lifted up from the tomb in the resurrection, and then lifted up finally from the world itself in the ascension. And after that, Jesus knows no one will be able to see him unless, unless those who follow him, those who claim to know him, are able to show people, to show people the way of Jesus because they walk that way themselves, are able to tell people the truth of Jesus because they believe it in their hearts are able to show people the life of Jesus because they demonstrate it in their own lives. The Greeks wanted to see Jesus, and they knew exactly how to find him. They went to his followers. My friends, my fellow Christians, the world still wants to see Jesus. Not our property, not our political power, not our piety, not our programs, not our parish lists. They wish to see our Lord Jesus. 
When we speak, may it be Jesus they hear. When we act, may it, see, may it be Jesus they see. And when they come to us, asking and searching, may it be Jesus they find. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name of every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow.
With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray, responding to the petition, Hear us, O God, singing. Your mercy is great. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, we pray for the church, that we may be an instrument of God's blessing, proclaiming God's love to all and for all, recognizing the blessing that is inherent in all commitments of love and fidelity. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, we pray for the world that we may reject the ways of hatred and bigotry. We pray for the seven women and the one man killed this week in Atlanta, for those grieving them, and for those in the Asian community who live in fear of harassment and racially motivated violence. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, we give thanks for COVID vaccines and pray for all who are administering them and those receiving them. May their distribution go smoothly and efficiently, and that all may live safely and with greater confidence. We pray for all who are sick, suffering, or alone, naming them aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your pray for those who are dying and those who are mourning, that they may know the peace of God. We give thanks for the lives of those now resting in peace, remembering Harold Brister, Diane Regan, and Dorothy Winifred Brown. Rest eternal grant unto them. And let bright perpetual shine upon them. Hear us, O God. Your Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of earth and heaven. Day by day you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, singing, The peace of the Lord be always with you. The Lord who gave his life for the life of the world, help you also to die to old ways, that you might follow him who is the way, the truth, and the life. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and those you love and serve, this day and always. Amen.
deeper in the love of Jesus and let others see Jesus in you. Thanks be to God.